Huh? Okay, now it's working again. Uh, let's get started. I think we need to get people coming in. Um, the next report is actually me, so let's get that started. Thank you. So let's uh, get uh, the EPIDIC uh, EC report for this year. Uh, start with the introductions. We've, you've seen this before. Uh, we are eight of us. Seven of us are elected. Uh, Paul, as the director general, is an ex-officio member. Uh, we are missing oh, quite a few right now but Rajesh and Yudon couldn't make it, uh, but others are here. Um, the functions of the APNIC EC is to represent the interest of members in the governance of APNIC. Uh, it provides an oversight of APNIC activities. Uh, we look at broad policy issues, internet policy issues uh, that have an effect on APNIC's strategic direction. We also set the membership fees, and then we uh, endorse policy um, consensus towards the implementation of uh, those policy in the APNIC region. Um, the APNIC EC meetings, uh, the APNIC EC meets, uh, usually meets four times a year in a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, Two of those face-to-face -face meetings are at the APNIC meetings, like this week and at the next meeting in uh, Dhaka. Uh, the two other meetings happen in between. Uh, we try to do those meetings at different regional NOCs or other internet uh, conferences. And we also try to do at least one meeting a year in uh, Brisbane office or <coughs> nearby. Uh, since the last AGM, uh, in, uh, in Korea, uh, we've had five face-to-face -face meetings. Um, last year in June, uh, we utilized one of our regular meetings uh, to have a strategic uh, planning uh, retreat. Um, so instead of spending just one day on a face-to-face -face meeting and heading home, we spent two and a half days um, looking at a longer term, um, the next four years of APNIC. Uh, that was in the APNIC office uh, in Brisbane. Uh, and then in Chiang Mai, at the APNIC 48 meeting, we also had a joint board meeting with the RIPE NCC board. Uh, the RIPE NCC is our, the RIR in the Europe uh, region. Um, the next EC meeting will be in Kuala Lumpur uh, at the end of the ICANN meeting. Um, in uh, Kuala Lumpur. Um, if I can decide to cancel, we'll figure that out. Uh, and all the meeting minutes and attendee records are on the APNIC website at apnic.net slash ec. We had a perfect attendance uh, in the last five meetings. Um, some of these are remote attendance, but we had perfect attendance. Okay, so this is the, uh, one of the, you know, things I talked about earlier and also in the opening to uh, Epricard is uh, we have a new strategic direction for the next four years, the 2020 plan. Um, the way it works is every four years, uh, the APNEC along with the staff uh, work to look at, okay, what do we do? How do we, you know, uh, set our goals for the coming years? and come up with a strategic plan. The strategic plan also involves how we report information back to the community and to <coughs> our stakeholders. So after going through that roughly eight, nine months of exercise, uh, in, in 2019, uh, we endorsed a new strategic plan for 2020, 2023, um, in, uh, well, earlier this week. A copy of the strategic plan is already on the website. Um, 
somewhere. <laughs> and uh, you can go through it, but I'll give you a quick uh, you know, highlight of it. Uh, so what we've done is, uh, in the four years we are, in the past we've reported and we've kind of structured our activities into four different uh, groups or four different headings. Going forward, we have expanded that to five uh, strategic pillars, we call them, and 18 work streams. So <laughs> five top level uh, groupings and then further within those five top level grouping, 18 more specific uh, work streams. Um, and then, you know, all of our future budgets, our strategic direction, planning, all will look back into the strategic plan and we'll tie back to it. So this is what it looks like at a very high level. We have the mission vision at the top. Um, we see, you know, this part, this, the thing in the top is uh, straight off from our bylaws. A global, open, stable, and secure internet to provide essential services as RIR and to support internet development in the AP region. So that, that is straight from our bylaws. We, we don't really change that. That continues to be our uh, primary guiding principles. And then we have um, five pillars. And uh, thanks to the comps team, it actually is a pillar there. Uh, though it's probably, you know, I don't know what kind of architecture that is. Uh, so the first pillar is membership. Uh, the second one is registry. The third one is development. Fourth one is information. And the fifth one is capab capability. Then we have the principles of our you know, passion, trust, curiosity, accountability, and inclusion. And the slogan is, we are APNIC. So going back to the five pillars, um, starting about two and a half, roughly two and a half, three years ago, we started pivoting towards a more product-led uh, development or product, product, into a product framework of our different services to our members. And this continues with that. So. Um, each of these pillars, uh, or at least three of these pillars, directly relate back to uh, the three products we have. Um, one of the pillars is a pretty much a supporting function for the foundation and things related there. And then, of course, the capability part is more of our institutional strengths. Uh, so and that's how we uh, kind of made it five pillars. So going into more detail, uh, membership is, you know, we have those under, under it, the high-level goals, uh, develop and deliver world-class product and services required by the APNIC members, and everything membership-related, including uh, accountable governance of APNIC as a membership organization. Then we have the registry function. You know, that is what an RIR does, provides a registry of uh, internet numbers in our region. So develop and deliver a world-class registry product. Um, sometimes I refer to it as registry V2. Um, that product will be able to, well, meet the changing ways in which uh, network operators and our members access the information from our registries. I, I don't think we can still say go do a who is uh, when you know, we need those products to support things like APIs and automated uh, pull and push up data. Then there is development. Uh, if you look at the previous slide, uh, one of the key things in the slide has always been um, up there, support the internet development. So uh, we've always done that. Uh, it is key part of our work. Um, so that is another one and which, uh, under which we also support the foundation. Um, and, and things like um, community infrastructure, root servers, NOGs. Uh, all of that. Then uh, we have the information pillar. Um, this is uh, more about supporting internet development with needed e network information services. Like we, we have all the work that comes out of our labs, like the work that Jeff does, all the work we publish at um, the APNIC uh, labs website, APNIC stats website, um, all of those plus our blogs, Everything else comes under that information products. And capability, of course, uh, that is our secretariat and, and the capability inside those. Uh, there's more details in there. Uh, you know, 
This, this is, I think, uh, what we uh, use the term strategy on a page, uh, S-O-A-P. Uh, and that is pretty much, you know, we, we have the whole strategy kind of visualized here in uh, one page. Uh, if you go to the uh, strategy plan, which has miraculously appeared here on my, in front of me, <laughs> uh, it's quite detailed. So under each of these uh, high-level headings, we break it down, all the way down to specific targets where it comes with, within each of those strategic pillars. Um, the APNIC EC worked to develop the high-level objectives, and the secretary had supplemented it with more specific goals within each of their work streams. And as we go into future, uh, each year, each of the annual plans will keep on enhancing those you know, indicators and uh, targets and we'll measure our performance against it and report back to the community. So this is a bit of a change, but the stuff we do is all the same. Uh, we believe this approach and some of the new things we, the focus on products uh, and the focus on providing measurable outputs to our members on the work we do uh, is going to help us in future to continuously improve the work we do in the community. So there's a lot of it. I'll not go through each and every one of this. So encourage you to go download the uh, strategic plan. Uh, what I also uh, have talked with Paul about is if you actually need a printed copy of this, we'll probably be printing some copies. Um, enroll, give your names to, I don't know, Sunny or Tony, or outside in the desk, and we'll try to get you a printed copy of this at some point uh, within the next couple of months uh, when we get it printed. Okay, that, that was about the strategic plan. The next uh, important thing is the, every two years we do the APNIC survey. A lot of the things that go into these strategic plans actually come out, or the focus for the annual plan and the strategic plan is uh, driven in a large part by the surveys. The surveys are both us going to the community and asking, hey, are we doing okay? Are we doing good? Are we not doing good? And what do you want us to look at? Or what do you want us to work on? And so we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, and the last one was in 2018. Uh, the next one will be in 2020. And basically, if you look at it, the, the planning cycle, and the strategic planning cycle kind of works in tandem with when the survey happens. The survey happens, the report comes out. The following year, we do the following two years of planning. And then that cycle continues. So the APNEC commissions uh, our survey. It is independent and anonymous. It is not done by APNEC Secretariat. We uh, engage an external uh, company uh, called Survey Matters to do this. They did the last one. Uh, survey Matters designs this. We approve it, and then they gather feedback from members and the community about our performance, priorities, and future activities. Now, we are doing a minor change. Uh, so far, in all the previous years, when we did survey, we had the survey, and we also had a focus group meetings where we gathered people in a room in different economies and tried to get feedback from them. Um, what we realized is those are not very effective uh, because, A, the, the number of participants were really small, and in a lot of these settings, we are not getting frank enough opinion from those participating, or we are not getting enough time uh, to spend with those. Um, so we are going to substitute those uh, focus group meetings uh, with more online interviews uh, conducted over Skype or Zoom or whatever works um, with you know individuals and folks that contribute a lot uh, to it. If you want to be interviewed, again, go put your name on a uh, chart outside. I think, Tony, we need to organize those two lists uh, on the help desk outside. And we'll probably, depending upon how many people sign up, uh, we might have to do a lottery to select uh, that. But you know, still, we appreciate your interest in participating in the service. The survey will be launched in late. Uh, oh, and then, yeah, we are expanding the use of language translation. Last year, last time we did survey, uh, we had uh, 
five languages, I believe. And 37% uh, of our responses came in languages other than English. And so based on that, we are actually increasing or going to make available more languages in the survey uh, in coming years. The survey will be launched in late June, July uh, with the objective that we are able to uh, give out the preliminary results by the uh, meeting in September in Dhaka. Uh, so between now and then you'll start seeing, or now in June you'll start seeing emails and updates and requests to fill out the surveys. And then we'll uh, complete that uh, in, hopefully in August, and then we'll have a report in September. Ah, finances. Uh, we talked about that earlier uh, before the break. Uh, as of 31st December, we had 7,776 members. We had a surplus exceeded budget by $47,000. Our investment portfolio grew a bit more. Um, this approval of 2019 audited financial statements, we presented that earlier. And uh, we've approved that. Uh, and we also had a new auditor this year. Um, so it's, it's best practice, and I believe also Australian law, that you need to change your auditors every five years. So previously, uh, we had, uh, who was our previous auditors? Now I don't remember. Uh, we changed our auditors. Now the new auditors are De uh, Deloitte uh, uh, as the new auditors, and they've given us uh, the audit report. Uh, and that is done for 2019. Um, and they will serve us for another five years and then we'll you know, have to look for another auditor again. Uh, we also approved the activity planning and budget for 2020 earlier this week. And that should be available for you soon. Um, we, in December, we uh, announced that we are going to uh, fall back on the fees uh, from 2015. So, Basically, there is a FAQ on our website and a whole bunch of communication that went out. But in a sense, uh, we had not increased our fees since 2010. The last time, that's, that's the last time we changed the structure and increased the fees. And in fact, 2015, we had reduced the fees. And now we've gone back to the pre-2015 uh, levels uh, of fees. and. Um, you know, made it applicable in January. Um, <coughs> I think the reason for that is we've seen, we've not adjusted to the inflation. Um, the Australian dollar has lot of, lost a lot of value, whereas in 2015 it was very, very strong. Uh, so some of those factors made, made the decision to, or made it uh, imperative for the EC to decide on that. And one of the other things we, had asked in the survey last year was one of the financial goals of APNIC is to keep uh, 18 months of operating reserve uh, in, in terms of liquid or solid assets. Um, we'd ask the question is if you know, members would prefer us to stick to 18, reduce it to a lower number, or actually increase it to something bigger. The overwhelming response was we want you to stick to 18 months. And the second highest was no, no, go to 24 months. And looking at that and, and the changing inflation, and uh, we decided to drop back to the pre-2015 uh, levels of fees. Uh, we can talk more about that later, but that, that was some of the few things that drove the reason for that uh, free ch fee change. Um, the other thing is uh, we have adopted a fully electronic voting system. Um, uh, we approved and introduced a fully electronic system. Uh, we use a system called Big Pulse. Um, it's an independent voting system. We reviewed a few. Big Pulse is also used by um, other RIRs, um, RIPE and uh, ARID. Uh, and I believe I can also use this for some stuff. Um, interestingly, they are an Australian-based company, so which is even better for us. Uh, so we decided to go with them. We had a bunch of testing uh, in, in December. Uh, if you are an APNIC contact of any kind, you 
probably received an email saying, hey, do you want to participate in the trial run of this voting system? So we did that. Uh, we ironed out some bugs, and then it has been in full production this week. So everything now will be electronic. Uh, there will be no paper uh, involved. And the same system will be adopted for other elections, like especially the NREC elections that uh, traditionally have been paper-based, and we'll go online with this. The good thing about that is we'll not have to wait a long time for the results to come back. So based on the experience this week or today, uh, next time we might actually you know, sort in the last session of the day a little bit. Uh, the other one is the EC business is uh, we appoint a member to the NRO, NC, ASOAC. We uh, renewed uh, the appointment of Simon Broy to the NRO number council. He's now on his second term. His term will end. Uh, at the end of this year. Uh, the current NRO, NC, SOAC uh, members on the members are these three, Aftab and Brazesen elected by the community, and Simon Boroy appointed by the EC. Thank you to them for their work and contribution on this. Policy-wise, uh, we had five policies that passed during the last, uh, in 2019 and reached consensus. And we've taken that all into uh, approve that, endorse that. Um, I'm not going to read all of that out, but uh, Prop 132, uh, which is uh, a you know commonly referred, we refer to that the AS0 policy, uh, is still in implementation phase. So is Prop 131 because that is a full review of the edit, you know editorial review of our IPv6 policy. So those two are implementation stage. The other three have been fully implemented. Um, and you know, in progress. So uh, we probably will have 131 and 132 go faster in terms of getting done, uh, given that uh, we don't have any policies to approve this week. Uh, thanks to everyone, the six chairs, the participants, the authors of the policies. So this is another topic we, uh, one of the strongest feedback that came out of the survey was, APNE, you should go and look at all these addresses that might not be in use and see if what we can do about it. So we've, uh, we've looked at it, you know, that's what Paul reported earlier. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to working on it. Uh, we don't know what the actual end results might be in whether they are actually claimable, reclaimable or not reclaimable, but we'll uh, go contact those address holders and see what we can do about it. Um, next meetings, future conference locations. Um, we are, okay, what happened to 50? <laughs> That's what I was looking at. So Ipinik uh, 50 will be in Dhaka, um, in Bangladesh. And we'll hear from our friends later today. Um, APNIC 51, which is uh, next year's apricot, uh, will be announced by apricot today in the closing ceremony. So I'll keep my mouth shut. Uh, APNIC 52 will be in Sapporo uh, in Japan, uh, hosted with the help of our friends at JPNIC. Uh, so thank you to JPNIC, thank you to the comms team, uh, to making it, you know, hopefully we'll do a good one. So Sapporo, JP Nick, thank you very much. Uh, uh, dates will be on the website after we, you know, kind of do some additional. They are already on the conference website. Yeah. Yeah. And then you know, uh, Epricard, Epinog continues to work on. Future apricots, um, and you know, we'll they'll probably most likely announce apricot 2020 at the meeting in Dhaka, uh, because the apricot in 2022 is supposed to be in South Asia. So I guess that is the target to be able to announce it there, announce the next uh, APNIC meeting in South Asia, a meeting in South, Asia, and so on. You know, um, the the. We go in a cycle, if you have not noticed by now, starting, I think, 2014. Um, it goes in cycle, Apricot and Apinic 
it's in tandem. So this year we are in Oceania for Ap Apricot or Apinic. Next one goes uh, from Oceania to uh, Southeast Asia, then South Asia, then North Asia, and back again. So keep on going in that cycle. So we welcome all member feedback, uh, suggestions, questions. There is a EC submission feature on my APNIC. If you are an APNIC member and have my APNIC access, there is also a contact us form on APNIC.net slash EC. And of, obviously, you can come and talk to us during these face-to-face meetings or at any other meetings that we are at to talk about APNIC business. Thank you. Uh, for listening to me. And we do have a small open mic again if there are any questions. Whoops. Oh, that's fine. Okay, so we, we can do a quick Q&A or I would actually think that we do a policy SIG uh, report after this, and then go on an open mic after that. That's what we've done traditionally. So, Sumun Bhai, at the chair of Policy SIG. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll just present the report on the Policy SIG meeting happened yesterday, and, and we, in fact, mostly yesterday we discussed few policies previously implemented, and uh, in the implementation phase, if you look at the agenda, that started with co-chair election, but before going to the agenda, I just uh, like to uh, refresh few things that uh, this time we are actually uh, working with a new policy charter we updated in last year. That is uh, uh, now new text says the policy six charter is to develop policies which relate to the management and use of internet number resources within the Asia Pacific region. This includes policies for resource allocation, recovery and transfer, and for resource registration within WHIS, reverse DNS, RPKI, and related services. And uh, these are the, those who are actually dealing with policy. I'm the chair, and Barton Sharier and Ching Han Ku are the co-chairs. It is also supported by NRNCS ASOAC. Already you seen the name, up to Sid Brothers Jane and Samuel Sun Barwi. And uh, this time, seat for Barton Sharier and Ching Han Ku was open for election. They completed their two years term. And there are the few steps we follow to the, follow to implement any policy in ethnic region. I'll not go through this detail. We all discussed in policy meeting. So two co-chair posts are open for election this time. Three candidates there, but one was not in the room. So both Barton Sharier and Ching Han Ku are re-elected for next two years. Barton and Sharier, congratulations to you. Can you please stand up just to those who doesn't know you? Thank you very much. <clears throat> and then uh, we move to the policy discussion with the implementation ad update uh, from Sunday Chandy. We initially discussed on editorial changes and IFUS policy, which is already will be uh, already implemented from 4th February 2020. And uh, we have a long discussion on Prop 132, that is RPK rules for unalloc unallocated and unassigned ethnic address spaces. Which is, which is pending implementation and targeted to R limit 20. And also discussed on Prop 132 implementation plan. I'll, I'll go, oh, the implementation plan for Prop 132 shared by George Michelson. And initial deployment plan was uh, mid-2020. And uh, in EPIC 50, with the statistics and status, there will be report. The test bed is already ready and a separate towel has been created to make, take minimum risks, risks. And there may be a period of 24 to 48 hours between the recovery of ROA and resource being delegated. Should this be a global policy or 
So what all are you are perform the same action or not? This is the question came. So we need to wait and see. And uh, if you have any comments on the implementation plan, it will be shared in the policy mailing list. So uh, you can uh, share your thoughts on the implementation plan. And uh, the Prop 125 is being implemented. So, so far, uh, 15,836 refer uh, referenced in resources and uh, 9623 email validation request issued. Around 62.3% validation rate. There are a few concerns raised by different stakeholders uh, about the interface and uh, about few technical issues, few operationals. So we'll, we'll wait for next six months and, and also improving the uh, interfaces, probably resolve those issues. We can uh, see the update in the next meeting again. And then actually, uh, Shanjua uh, discussed about transfer consolidation. You know that uh, we have a policy that uh, the last slash 1038 slash block uh, cannot be transferred for five years. But it happened to be that uh, for some allocation in already past five years, and uh, we can see some consolidation, some acquisition of one or three slash eight blocks, but uh, it needs to be considered as a problem or not a problem. We need to wait and see. Then uh, <clears throat> there are some policy analysis, existing current policy, what we're using, and uh, staffs also observed the, their observation on the proposed policy to be discussed. And uh, one policy that uh, experimental allocation policy that Anyone can take allocation for the last 24 for research purpose for one year. And after that, it will be quarantined for another one year. But EPNIC doesn't have any reserve pool at this moment for that, so it may go from slash one or three. But still, we don't see that much request from there. But this is something we may need to think in future. And uh, there is some reserve space comparison with other IR. EPNIC doesn't have any for especially IXP kind of deployment or any other requirement. And uh, then in the second session started with the presentation from Jeff Houston. The end of days, the end of days of IPv4. So he presented the consumption of IPv4 space and impact on different policies in different time frame and, and try to gauge the end of days of the remaining fools on different model based on the past consumption statistics. He also discussed about the reserve pool and their unreservation with time. And then we move to the policy discussion. We have three policies uh, this time. Prop 130, modification of transfer policy. Objective is to ensure that the policy text is clarified. If those cases are supported by the community, it will also facilitate companies or business units moving or being established in other regions. But uh, the proposal didn't reach consensus in the policy meeting, and back to the mailing list again. Prop 133, clarification of sub-assignment. This also didn't reach consensus in the policy meeting, and uh, send back to the mailing list again. Prop 134, PDP update, to clarify few things in the PDPs, but uh, Again, didn't reach consensus, but uh, the information is that the PDB document and the C guidelines are pretty old. So uh, in the last meeting, we discussed to whether we can review the documents and uh, then we can uh, update it. So AC actually instructed Secretary to from a review committee and that, uh, we'll be expecting to get the review in next meeting in Dhaka. And uh, the proposal for PDA update didn't reach consensus, and the author withdrew the proposal in this meeting. And uh, that's all from the policy SIG session this time. If you have any questions, if not, thank you very much. Thank you, Simon Wai. Okay, so we have a couple of minutes of open mic. If you have any comments on either the EC report or 
well, the EC report mainly. Uh, thanks to the EC. Uh, my name is Simon. I'm from Fiber at Home. Uh, uh, as Gorovda was saying that about the language, today is uh, 21st February, International Mother Language Day. So from Bangladesh and the whole Bengali community, I will request to the EC to add Bengali next time. Thank you. Yep, uh, Simon, I appreciate it. We'll do that. We'll look into it. Uh, any other? If there are no other comments on the uh, EC report, then we move on to the next presentation. I have been told that Billy is not ready yet, so uh, can we get uh, Joey Chan for the cooperation SIG? Thank you, Yisi, and uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Joy Chen. I am currently heading the chair for the cooperation SIG. And uh, as we, um, from the cooperation SIG, the special interest group is really formed for discussion about a very broad internet issues. There's the public policy, there's the internet governance, and there's related to all our APEC community interest. And we also involve something with the government, organization, and other communications. So from last year at Chiang Mai that we have kind of like put the focus on this um, internet jurisdiction, we had a very interesting discussion. And uh, this year following on, we are focusing on the cybersecurity incident. We are explored how a lot of the recent discussion on the cyber norm has the impact to our community and all the different incident response, the capabilities and everything else, so that we can prevent the escalation for the cross-jurisdiction com conflicts. So this is our really the theme for this year. And uh, to kick off the session, we, had a, uh, we actually had a re-election for the co-chair, and the Bikram, who's the current co-chair, will continue to be practice as our co-chair. So um, we had a talk, the keynote for our session, Nicole, who talks about the cyber norm evolution. This is kind of like an introduction or a, a background setting for everyone. So we're talking about the different cyber activities, which we have the different behavior. We have um, the different cyber norm that's happening. So we talk about the different type of this multi-stakeholder model and the cyber sovereignty models. We also, she has introduced the evolution process and everything. So I think after that, we were very happy to have a very strong panel coming to our special interest group. We have um, um, Marika from the state. We have Salman from Bangladesh. We have right here from Australia, the um, um, Brownwing, she bring also some very interesting uh, thoughts here. We have the CERTs who are actually working with the cybersecurity incidents, very hands-on. Uh, Yoka from JP Search and the Rahana from Sarianka Search. And of course our um, co-chair background was also having some contribution in our panel discussion. What do we talk about in the panel discussions? We're talking about the different policy makers with the, te the technical community that we have a majority here. As we know that we have the need to really bridge the gap between the policy making and as well as the community uh, from the technical communities. When the policy is made, we wanna make sure that it can be executed it has the right setting grounds so the technical community can actually follow with the different process and procedures. In particular, that in this uh, short discussion on the policy making or technology um, communities, we also want to talk about how the norm and regulation that we can discuss from the internationally, as you see from our panelists, from very diversified um, so we can um, affect the handling of the response of the incident. 
We also have talked about the different practical search, C search, ISPs. Are there limitations? Are there definitely needs for the different focuses that we want to do? And the role of the ISP on fishing mitigation. So all this was being touched upon in our panel discussion. And then we focus into our very focus on the norm. Are this cyber norm, are they helping us in the search responsibility activities or are they hindered? Okay, because at the recent IGF um, workshops in um, Berlin last year, the view was that many of the search community felt that there was a kind of like a delay when we have to access through these proper channels. But yet we also know that there's a lot of the communication between, like say, the search community that's happening. So um, when the communication needs to go through the formal channels, are they really going to delay? I think this is one of the interesting topics that we are very um, eager to find out so that we can make our job easier, faster, and more responsive. So um, from there, we're focusing on the wanna cry. This case, I think it doesn't happen long ago from 2017. I think this is an incident that we all remember that how did we handle from our own economy. So this topic was also being discussed about um, how do we help improve the cooperation and what exactly really happened. So we have search um, delegates from the panel to discuss that and to really share about how fast and how responsive that people were really doing at the wanna cry incidents to give everybody an update on that. So at the end, we concluded, if there's one word that I can say, it's the information sharing. We'll talk about from the policy making to the technical community, if we have information sharing, the more trust that we can build, the sharing that we can have, the cooperations that we can make is definitely going to be improving on the positive side of better things to do. And bridging the gap is one of the things very, very important. So from our cooperation, I think there's a spirit for the cooperation among the different communities between the policy making, between the execution parties that we concluded that we really have the information sharing as uh, we will say for this uh, session. So from all of us above on this picture, in our cooperation SIG, we want to give the thanks to the floor to everybody uh, who attended our session. We had a wonderful time, and hopefully that we can dip more in the next year on. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joy. Thank you. Thank you, Joy, and also to the other uh, co-chairs of the cooperation SIG. Uh, the next, uh, I would like to ask the the newly elected chair of the routing security SIG, Aftab, to come into the presentation. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, uh, Gaurav. Uh, yes, so. We had the inaugural session of the routing security SIG. Um, it was routing security slash RPKI slash hysteric SIG when we started uh, um, this APNIC meeting. Uh, but now uh, it's been finalized as a routing security SIG. So let me give you some details. Um, as per the APNIC uh, SIG guidelines, um, um, at the first meeting, you were supposed to do two things. Number one is elect chair. Um, we had some changes in the uh, guidelines, so you don't have to elect co-chairs in the first meeting. You only elect the chair on the first meeting. And um, endorse the draft charter. But because of the confusion in the last meeting that we couldn't finalize the name of the um, uh, SIG, so that was uh, one thing we added uh, as part of the agenda in the session. So this is the chair. I was um, uh, elected as a chair for this uh, six, thanks to support from the community. And uh, we still have the um, co-chairs, that is Dr. Dima and Rupesh Reshta, which uh, of, unfortunately both were unable to join us in person uh, because of the travel ban and um, uh, visa issues. So we finalized the name. Uh, the name is now Routing Security SIG. Uh, the other options we discussed was RPKI SIG and the Routing SIG. Um, um, we had, there were some discussion on that, but uh, now the name is there. 
Um, now Secretary will um, create the mailing list for this purpose, uh, and we will start working on that. The second thing was to decide the SIG charter. Uh, so two uh, words I have highlighted in red, that was the only um, uh, update from the community. Everything else was uh, was uh, part of the draft charter, which we discussed in the last meeting. So nothing else has been changed um, um, other than two minor changes, which I have updated and which will be updated on the website as well. So uh, we couldn't share it yesterday because the time was limited, uh, but this is our plan for APNIC 50. Uh, so people who are interested in the routing security in RPKI and other stuff, please make, uh, make a note. Uh, what we are planning to do is um, uh, discussions on the, uh, from the APNIC uh, RPKI or IRR services uh, and its update, uh, something which was shared in the policy uh, SIG. Uh, but, but we made it very clear that any, any policy discussion will remain in the policy SIG, but anything technical can uh, fall into the routing security SIG. We will definitely work closely with the policy SIG chair to make sure that there is no overlap. Um, the, one of the major tasks which, uh, the, uh, which myself and the co-chairs have uh, uh, decided that we will create uh, route validation uh, BCP. We have done two deployathons so far. We'll try to document everything and make sure that it is up there for the community to review. Um, and we'll try. We'll start documenting the whole um, uh, deployathon in the best possible manner. There are a lot of things that are happening in the ITF on the RPKI. Um, the idea is to make sure the community is aware of that. That what are the new development and what new changes are happening. Global RPKI statistics, there are too many tools out there, uh, so make sure that we give the right uh, tools to the community. Uh, relying by party software, we, we have limited, so make sure we will invite the vendors to be there to share uh, the updates and what's happening. Unfortunately, people, uh, uh, okay, fortunately we had one from the RIP NCC. Unfortunately, we didn't have anyone from the other three organizations. So uh, we do have confirmation, uh, we do have commitment from at least uh, NLNet labs uh, that they will show up in the next one. So let's see how it goes. That's our target for evening 50. If you are interested, please reach out to us. Um, mailing list will be set up soon. Uh, how soon, I'm not sure. But the moment it sets up, we will start spamming all the other mailing lists so that people can join. Uh, that's it from my end. Thank you so much. If any question. Thank you, Aftab. Okay. And congratulations to the SIG chair and the new co-chairs and the new SIG. Uh, the SIG was formed after quite a while of the routing security buff. And so I think right timing with RPKI seems to be the new, like, you know, the happening this year. Uh, now we have, I think Billy is still copying his slides. Ready? Art? Okay. Okay, so maybe we, we go on to the hackathon report then. You ready with the hackathon report? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, IPv6 deployment system. Kenny? Yeah, sure. Yep, let's move on. We haven't come out with slides. Can we get Kenny's presentation up? Okay. 
Okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, Kenny Huang, I'm happy to deliver IPv6 de uh, de uh, deployment report. Okay, uh, during the opening 49, we have four presentation uh, the agenda including uh, Jeff Houston by a, a chief scientist from APNIC. He's giving a report on IP, IPv6 performance report. And also David Wuke from Tesla giving the introduction regarding to how the IPv6 traffic pattern going to be within the Telstra. And also we have uh, Jack Wang from Zhonghua Telecom introduced Zhonghua Telecom IPv6 de deployment and user experience monitoring. And the last one would be uh, uh, Jing Hengu from TWNIC introduced IPv6 CPE development and interoperability testing. Okay, the first one was uh, presented by Jeff Houston. He introduced IPv6 performance and uh, using the data gathered from APNIC IPv6 measurement system to analyze reliability and speed with IPv4 and IPv6. So he given a uh, uh, quite intensive monitoring regarding to how IPv6 and IPv4 uh, dual, dual stack traffic pattern going to be, uh, how, how they going to be distribution, and also uh, giving the suggestion to assist IPv6 robustness because there are some sort of uh, traffic error. How can we monitor that kind of traffic error? How can we handle pre or mitigate that kind of error? And besides IPv6 reliability issue, and also need to have a very serious issue regarding to the past discovery, um, past MTU discovery management. And also, I think that's quite important because when, right now, most of the service provider, they are using dual stack. And the past dis discovery system also is probably beyond the control within the service provider. So we need to pay more attention on how we're going to handle the dual stack traffic within the operator network. So second presenter, presented by uh, David Wuke uh, from Telstra, he introduced how the IPv6 traffic going to be. Uh, for, for example, Starting to introduce a long history for Telstra IPv6 timeline, uh, it took 12 years uh, from IPv4 only to current state. Current status right now is v4 and v6 dual state. And Telstra has been progressively rolling out IPv6 to, to customer according to the major level product. So based on the Telstra, they have very large IPv6 user base. But IPv6 traffic is still quite low, depends on the traffic type. For example, they only have, I think it's 4% for international IPv6 traffic. And David, David also gave his explanation how come it's so low, because major carrier, major content owner like uh, Facebook, like uh, Google, they have massive cache locate in within domestic network. So that means the long tail theory, most of the international traffic go to the small provider. So they only can allow to provide IPv4. And that kind of pattern is quite interesting because it's quite totally opposite to, to some other provider as well. So that's why they, this uh, deployment uh, workshop is, uh, stick is quite interesting because we see the different uh, traffic pattern within different economy, different region and they all have different configuration and different problems to solve. The next one would be John Telecom introduce IPv6 de uh, development, uh, deployment and user experience monitoring. Uh, because uh, IPv6 status and deployment in John Telecom, they have massive uh, uh, deployment in the IPv6. Latency issue and CP MTU discovery issue also uh, has been responsed by, by the users. And use their quality of environment platform to know the user experience by simulation. They also have statistical data from both IPv4 and IPv6 connection. The last one was uh, by Gu Jinhen from TWNIC, introduced CPE development and interoperability testing. Uh, because the CPE is one of important part in the IPv6 uh, environment. So we organized CPE IPv6 interoperability testing item to test IPv6 CPE and also verify the function and stability of 10 popular IPv6 CPE from four brands in Taiwan. The testing result is very helpful to raising, uh, to raising IPv6 penetration, and we try to encourage most of manufacturers, try to encourage them to uh, adopt IPv6 capability. And also with the recommendation by, by Judy, uh, he insists that we should support IPv6 only product. So we take this as experienced and try to talk to our manufacturer, how can they uh, launch IPv6 only product? So that's pretty much all of my presentation. Any questions? Thank you.
Any, any questions for Kenny? Okay, we don't have any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, Tom is right here. Uh, so, uh, I look to think, uh, are, do, do you have Tom's presentation for APIX? Okay, let's put the APIX one up. He's here, right here. So yeah, uh, we, we make some adjustments as we have some time, or we gain some time. So uh, next we'll have uh, Tom Paseka present the APIX uh, report. There you go. Thank you. Um, so wearing my APIX hat, I'm on the steering committee of APIX. Um, and we want to give you an update of our meeting that we had um, here earlier this week. <coughs> there we go. Um, what is APIX? Um, it's the Asia Pacific um, Internet Exchange Association. Um, we're an association of internet exchange providers in the APAC region, um, established in 2010. Um, this is actually our 10-year uh, anniversary meeting um, of the organization. Um, you know IXs very well. Um, it's where ISPs and ICPs connect and exchange their traffic in order to reduce latency, improve costs between them, reduce and make the internet better. Um, according to the PCH directory, there's 26 countries, economies with IXs in the region and 119 active internet exchange points. Um, why do we have an association? Um, doing the same business in each country economy um, and having almost the same kinds of issues. We wanted to have an organization where people could come together and share their challenges. Um, to share operational information and experiences, um, business issues, solutions, overall how do we run internet exchanges and how can we learn from each other and get better. Uh, there's 32 IXP members from 18 countries and economies um, and we added two um, in this past year. Um, I'm not going to go through the entire list of them as there's a lot up there. Um, but the two new ones that we added are JKTIX um, from Indonesia and uh, THIX from Thailand. Um, again, here's our list of, of complete members, the same as the previous slide. Um, we, we now have 32 members across the region. Um, the steering committee um, is run by five volunteers. Um, two of those volunteers were up, um, their terms had ended, um, Toyama-san and uh, Vijay from Equinix. Um, Toyama-san was, was re-elected um, and Walt Wanley is nominated from JBIX has also joined the steering committee. Um, this is a history of our meetings. Um, we had about approximately 60 attendees um, during the meeting uh, on, on Monday. Um, is continuing to get bigger as well as our membership grows. Um, here's a chart showing the growth of members as well. So when we started out, there were eight members um, who founded the organization. Now we're up to 32 members. Um, one of the things we discussed here, uh, we talked about, sorry, excuse me. <coughs> um, sharing experiences common amongst countries. We also did personal, so if someone from the IX would stand up and say um, who they are, what are they doing, um, and request to the IXPs from, from networks like Google or Hurricane. Um, one of the things we achieved is we, we contribute to an open peering community. Um, we we want to make sure that the internet remains open, and we're also supporting an op open and neutral peering forum called Peering Asia. Um, during this last meeting, um, we had some, some good discussions. We talked about the overview of what peering looks like across this region, across Oceania especially, um, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia. Um, we also had um, visitors from outside of the region, so from Brazil, um, the, the uh, internet, major internet exchange there joined. We also discussed what API should do for the next 10 years, um, thinking about how the last 10 years were and what's, what's coming for the next 10 years. Um, thank you. Any questions? 
And of course, always we appreciate the support from APNIC and Apricot. Sanjaya yep. from APNIC. Uh, just, Tom, if you could go back to the new uh, member, JKT, JKT-IX. Yep. I think the country code is ID, not IN. Oh, thank you. Just a small correction. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, we'll fix that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, I'm trying to think whether we should do lunch or just have Billy come and present, but uh, based on what uh, Philip said on day one, uh, the restaurant prefers us to stagger lunch, so we might get there early today. Um, and then folks who have not yet voted can still complete their voting in the next two hours uh, because the voting will uh, close at 14.30. Uh, that is when we come back here at 2.30 p.m. Uh, so we'll uh, break for lunch, and then when we come back, uh, we will uh, announce the closure of the voting period and then have a few more presentations before we end the meeting. So uh, we break now. Please uh, do complete your voting uh, during lunchtime because we'll be closing this pretty much at the end of uh, lunchtime. So thank you very much. Lunch as usual downstairs. You must have coupons in your uh, 